From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. A segment from this week's Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. This time, Dustin Pindle, Bob Weber, and Brad White will talk about trends in cattle producer demographics. Among those, the aging cattle producer population and the future of smaller scale cow-calf operations. Then K-State's Rich Llewellyn will look ahead to the 2018 Risk and Profit Conference here at K-State. That'll provide participants with cutting-edge information on farm and ranch economics and management, including over 20 breakout sessions, which we'll talk about with Rich. Further ahead, then with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, and more here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. This is the K-State Radio Network, and for openers on this agriculture today, another BCI cattle chat from the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State, a portion of the weekly podcast from the group. This go-round, veterinarian Brad White, livestock economist Dustin Pendle, and cow-calf specialist Bob Weber will talk cattle producer demographics. Here's Brad. Dustin, you came across some numbers and We've both been in conferences uh, recently, two separate conferences, where somebody brought up the age of beef producers and how that's changing. And you looked up actually some numbers. Yes. So a lot of times when you go to uh, any conference, workshop, wherever, and it's always, hey, this is the average age of a producer and they're, it's really, they're getting older. We've got to do something because everything's going to come crashing down. So I went out, did some research, looked at the past census, uh, USDA census, which is done every five years to kind of look at the average age and also the distribution. Got some questions for you guys to, to see, test your knowledge on the uh, average age of producers. So dun, dun, dun. we're just going to go back to 1978, which is a great year because that was the year I was born. Um, <laughs> so 40 years ago, actually. So what is the average age of a producer in 1978? I'm going to say... Fifty nine point three. Fifty nine point three. I say fifty six and a half. Fifty six and a half. All right. Before I give you the answer, I want to ask a couple more questions, and we'll basically know the other responses. So, what is it in two thousand twelve? Two thousand twelve was six well, years ago. That was, was the last time reasoning. the census. Okay. Uh, last time the census has been reported. That's where I pulled my other number from. I think it was around fifty nine. So I'm uh, I'm going to stick with that. Okay, fifty nine. I'm going to say sixty three. So you're saying it increased over that the producers are getting older yeah. over time, Average and I'm saying they're staying about the same. Well, Brad is closer to the number, but Bob is right; is it is increasing across time, age. And so, in 2012, the USDA winners. census, <laughs> you both get participation both. medals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's 58.3 is the average age of a producer in 2012, according to the Ag Census. If we go back to 1978, 40 years ago, it was 50.3. 50.3. So it's going up eight years. It's going up yeah. eight years. And if you take a look at back in 2007, 2002, 2000, or 1997, it's averaging about two, two and a half percent every five years. It, it increases. It, it increases, yeah. How does that line up with the, the change in, in average life expectancy of Americans? It's probably pretty parallel, I would No, guess. that'd be more. That's a, that's a pretty good increase. That's a pretty good increase, eight years over that 40 year period. That's more than life expectancy has increased over oh, that yeah, time. Yeah, no, I definitely. I don't. I don't know what the number is off the top of my head, but however, I, I would wonder how that aligns with the number of people in ag. So there are, are potentially there fewer, are fewer yeah. people in ag, and those operations are getting bigger as a whole. Yeah. Which so would which have would the advantage to do that are typically older landholders potentially yep. so. more equity. Yeah. Is that, so. One other comment I want to make is it's 
yes, the number's going up, the average age is going up across time. But what's interesting is actually the distribution. So if you can look at the distribution of people who are 65 and older, 18% of producers in 1978 were 65 and older. You compare that to today or 2012 numbers, and it's probably pushing 25%. 25% so there's more and more producers are getting older. And then so about you, a 7% increase in the 65 and older right. category. And then if you look at the uh, 55 to 65 age category, that's also getting a little bigger. Where it's getting smaller is the young producers, the people who would be entering into it. And that's the uh, under 25, 35, 25 to 34, and even the uh, 35 to 44 categories getting smaller. So, it's so a, really, it's a distribution that's really interesting is older producers are getting older or they're staying in a lot longer, uh, which raises the question, why is that? We just talk, you I mean, you just asked that question effectively. Why is that? And then also, I think that has implications for farm size, which we, you just mentioned that as well. Yeah. And I think that w- one of the questions on the, and it may be more interesting to think about on the younger side that actually, so we could say we're having more older producers or we're having fewer younger producers right. and people entering in and the entrance costs, depending on what segment of ag that you're talking about can be quite high and it can be quite challenging to get into yeah. ag, especially yeah. we talk about beef cows a lot. I mean, there's land costs, cow costs, all those things. Yeah. In the last few years, if you wanted to enter into beef cows, challenging. Yeah. Big, big barrier to entry. Right? Yep. So, well, and, and so, so think- should we worry about that? Is that, is that something that, cause at the meetings I've seen it, they say, well, average producers are getting older and this is something we should be concerned about. Is, is this a concern or? I mean, there's going to be some, definitely some transition, I think, as some of these guys exit, but I don't know that. It's nothing that we won't handle. We can't handle. I, I, I think you, as they retire and exit the industry, I think you'll continue to see fewer and fewer. Op- I mean, there's not – when one retires, you're not going to have a new one enter, I don't yeah. think. I think what's going to happen is these individuals who are older, who probably have larger farms, will then be More purchased by maybe a mid-age, and so they continue to get bigger. But I don't think you're going to see a one retires, one enters. I think it's just going to be fewer producers, and I think farm sizes are going to continue to get Bigger, which is what the trends we've been seeing. More consolidation. And and I think what's interesting there and one of the take-homes is the average age of producers, when you look from 78 to 2012, based on the census, has gone up from about 50 to 58. So that's that's an interesting, and that is is an increase. The other other question or the offshoot, and as we talk about consolidation, so there are about 725,000 cow-calf producers in the U.S., Many of those producers have operations that, that have a relatively small herd size. So we got a question from our, one of our listeners saying, what's the forecast for these small producers? And, and Dustin, you just said maybe more consolidation. Do you, do you think that's going to hold true? What do you think is going to happen? Uh, no, I think it will continue. I mean, that's what the trends have been. We've seen fewer and fewer operations. So it'd be interesting to see how many cow calf beef producers there were back in 1978. I assume there's a lot more. Yeah, uh, I, I think there were, and I think we could probably pull. We could probably figure could pull yeah. those numbers and look at that. I think you know the the, the trends clear that the percentage of young producers is decreasing, um, and many of those might be kind of the smaller entrance into the into the business. So they start with twenty or thirty cows, and certainly you look through demographically uh, or geographically. Um, you know, the south and southeast has lots of small acreage, and so in in some areas. Those small producers make a lot of sense just because of, of land use and land availability. So, but you also the ratio of cows per acre of grass that you run is different in that part of the country. Right. So you don't need as many acres. It's not like in the southwest part of the country where it's one to eighty, yeah. one cow per eighty acres. There, you may be at one to one, one cow calf pair per acre. So yeah, so doesn't so take forty or an eighty. You can run. You know, 40, 50 cows and all of a sudden you're not a small producer anymore, right? So, yeah, that's right. And, and I think, and, and I agree there will be some consolidation, but I also think, uh, that is another vehicle for land use in many areas of the country. And we're still going to have those parcels of land that that makes a lot of sense. So I think there's a place for those smaller producers, but I also think that is an area of opportunity for them to still work to capitalize for efficiency. So a lot of us, and, and even those of us sitting in this room, would fall into that small producer category where we've got a few, yeah. and you got to figure out how to make that efficient and make it work in the system. What do you think from an economic standpoint? Is that there's still going to be some viability there, oh. or are we going to become vertically integrated like some of our other... No, and I don't think we will. I think the, the beef industry is enough 
independent, if you will, that you're always going to have. So growing up, we had, I don't know, 20 cows or so. And mom, dad both worked off farm. And that was just a hobby, I guess, if you will. Basically keep me, my brother, both my sisters fully employed before school, after school and during the summer. Yeah. Uh, and so I think there will always be that opportunity there. And I think maybe they're not, that's not, that's not going to be the income provider. I mean, that's more of a, whether it's introducing, you know, work habits to your uh, children or just a side business that maybe there are, so you, you do make a little bit of money from it, but I think there'll always be those opportunities for people who a just it's a hobby or B maybe it's a way to get into the industry. You start off with, like you're saying 20 head and that allows you to continue to grow over time. So what you want to produce, how you want to produce it, what type of product that you, that you're putting out, but you're still it, a large part of our industry falls into that category. So I think it's something that's important to address as, as we go through. And I think the forecast is good for small producers that do well at their job and maintain efficiency. I don't think it's as good for small producers that aren't paying attention to larger industry trends. What, what oh, I think, you're, I think you're right. I think the, the, one of the biggest challenges for small producers is just cost containment. You know, the amount of overhead stuff that you have to have to run 20 cows isn't materially different than if you had 50 cows. Yeah. And so that makes the, the cost per cow for those non-feed cost things pretty expensive. The other piece is though the feed cost, right? So, you know, if you're in the, the convenience driven sort of feed acquisition, you probably don't seek out a lot of commodity byproducts or other sources of feedstuffs that are markedly less expensive than, you know, some of the alternatives you can buy out but, on the open but more market. labor but more, more labor, labor intensive, intensive right and so you've got to have the ability to store them which yeah. if you've got just a few cows buying a semi-load so of feed is of distillers probably doesn't make a lot of sense that's right yeah that so. makes sense we appreciate you joining us today if there are other comments questions please send them to us at bci at ksu.edu thanks for joining us on this bci cattle chat Bob Weber, Dustin Pendle, and Brad White of K-State. To hear the entire podcast for this week, go to beefcattleinstitute.org, beefcattleinstitute.org. This is Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. This part of Agriculture Today is going to offer you producers a full overview of an upcoming and always important event. Out of the Agricultural Economics Department here at K-State, it's the Annual Risk and Profit Conference here on the campus. It's set for the latter part of August. We'll lend details, of course, in just a moment. Along with us from the Agricultural Economics Department, an extension assistant there, Rich Llewellyn. Rich is responsible in a large part for coordinating this program every year. And we'll list through some of the highlights of this year's Risk and Profit, Rich. But remind us of the premise of this event. It uh, reaches out to producers and anybody basically allied with the agriculture cultural industry, right? That's correct. We have a lot of producers, but also a lot of ag lenders who attend, as well as crop insurance agents, uh, agribusiness managers, extension personnel. Uh, so it's a very wide range of folks who attend. Uh, it started about 23 years ago with the intent of kind of being a showcase for some of the research going on in the ag econ department at K-State. So uh, it's continued and uh, continues to fulfill that function, uh, providing information for folks that are needing it. Plus, there are added features to the research reviews that we will certainly talk about here. This is set for Thursday and Friday, August the 16th and the 17th at the Alumni Center here on the K-State campus. Is there a specific theme aligned with this program this year? One of the main things is our uh, keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Richard Crowder, and he's going to be talking about trade issues. Uh, he's not sure what direction that's going to take, <laughs> actually. He's still waiting some to uh, see what happens with some of the tariffs and, and some of the other things going on in the trade scene. So uh, he is a former uh, trade negotiator for agriculture uh, in the Bush administration and is still at Virginia Tech 
working with trade issues, and so he'll be coming to discuss that. Uh, so that'll be a very important part of it. In fact, he will open the program up as the lunch speaker on Thursday the 16th, and he brings a vast wealth of experience in the area of trade. Yes, so his comments does. will be extremely timely. And he knows what's going on, but we'll also be able to discuss it since he's no longer in that position. So that'll be a helpful thing, too. That ought to be a great session in and of itself. But following his presentation, Dr. Richard Cratters will be the first of the rounds of breakout sessions. And here's where the reviews of K-State Agricultural Economics Research come in, right? That's correct. We have seven sessions altogether, four on Thursday and three more on Friday morning. Uh, And so folks will be able to choose from a total of 22 different topics, choose seven to uh, participate in and attend. These involve presentations of research being done by the faculty in our department. It'll involve discussion as well as presentation, so uh, opportunities to ask questions and learn more of what's going on there. Rich, you say there's some weight toward the livestock side this year. There is a little more this year. We uh, have several presentations on uh, the uh, cattle marketing, on cow-calf profitability, live cattle markets, and and some things like that that uh, we haven't had always in the past. So uh, it's a a crops-oriented conference a lot of times, but we do have more livestock than sometimes. And just to add some specifics there, K-State's Brian Coffey, for instance, will talk about the principles of hedging livestock sales using futures markets. Brian will be joined in another breakout session by K-State's Ted Schroeder and Glenn Tonzer as they'll examine risk management in evolving live cattle markets. K-State's Dustin Pendle, Kevin Herbel, and Whitney Bowman will take on cow-calf profitability, where to focus management for success. And here's a unique one. Glenn Tonzer will team up with Budhika Patali to look at the impact of climate change and geographic movement of cattle production. So again, those sessions oriented toward the livestock production side of it. And, Rich, there will be, not surprisingly, a session on what's happening with the farm bill. As maybe that'll be headed down the home stretch come risk and profit conference time. We sure do. We don't know exactly what will happen between now and then, but uh, Michael Taylor and Art Barnaby will be discussing what the situation is at the time that the conference takes place. So if something has been passed, then they'll be discussing, you know, what's in the bill. If it hasn't, they'll discuss what the two uh, chambers of Congress have come up with so far and what's going on in the conference committee as they debate that and try to figure it out. Plus, there are several of those workshops, breakout sessions, uh, oriented toward tax-related subjects. We do have several things. The uh, new Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed in December and takes effect this year. And so we have Roger McCowan, who's on the faculty at Washburn University uh, in the law school, uh, one of the premier ag law persons in the country. And so uh, he and uh, Mark Dykeman will be discussing that act itself. But we also have some other issues uh, related to farm payrolls. So uh, it's something that uh, could be very helpful for folks trying to figure out the tax side of things. And just to uh, further whet the appetite for these breakout sessions, other samples, K-State's Alan Featherstone and Robin Reed will take on Kansas farm finance issues. Michael Taylor and uh, Allison Pitts will be addressing in their session the value of social capital in farmland leasing arrangements. And somewhat associated with that, how much do landlords benefit from agricultural subsidies versus tenants? K-State's Nathan Hendricks has put together some interesting insight on that. Also, K-State's Bill Golden will be back in town. He'll join uh, Matt Sanderson and uh, Bridget Guerrero to look at attitudes toward groundwater use in the Ogallala Aquifer. Just one more to mention here. Can adjustment of planting dates offset the warming impacts for Kansas sorghum production? And once more, that's just part of the lineup. Rich, you have upwards of 20 breakout sessions overall? We have over 20 this year, uh, 22 that will happen throughout the conference. And producers, it's a la carte, basically. They can yes, select they what can. they'd like to go to and win. That's correct. So they'll be able to take a look at it. And on the brochure that we have, we have the topics and stuff. They can uh, pre-register, but they're not limited to what they decide. Uh, they can change it once they get to the conference. 
Now, Rich, a feature that was introduced at Risk and Profit several years ago and with great response to it will once again take place the evening of Thursday the 16th. This is called A Conversation with a Kansas Producer. Remind us of what that's about. We've been doing this about 10 years now, and it's been very well received uh, where we have a producer, a Kansas producer, who comes in and uh, in an interview format uh, describes what he's doing, uh, some of the innovative things that he's tried, some of the things that work, and sometimes some of the things that don't work. And so this year we have Bob Hazelwood from over south of Topeka coming in. From Hazelwood Farm, and he's an experienced and a successful producer in that northeast Kansas area. So he'll share his story, and there'll be plenty of time for interaction with him during that session. Yes, sir. Then the next day, Friday, August the 17th, there'll be more of the breakout sessions, uh, but uh, those are sandwiched in between the market outlooks by our K-State specialists. Right. In the morning, first thing, Dan O'Brien, our grain marketing specialist who's from Colby, uh, will be here to uh, share his outlook on the grain markets for 2018 into 2019. And uh, again, some of the trade issues that are going on, especially in the soybean market, he'll be uh, focusing on that. Uh, looking at uh, how this may affect uh, the markets down the road, uh, what's going on at the time of the conference, too. Then uh, after lunch, we'll have Glenn Tonzer with the uh, Livestock Outlook, primarily cattle, but he also does take a look at some of the other breeds as well, and uh, looking at what's going on there, looking at trade as well as production and costs, and uh, he just has a a pretty wide range of, of things he looks at with that. So once again, it's a great program through and through. Both days are worth one's while. And registration isn't due imminently, but it's time that producers and others who would like to take part in risk and profit start thinking in that direction. That's right. The uh, deadline for the cheaper rate is uh, August 13th, so it's still about a month away. But uh, we like having folks uh, go ahead and register as soon as they can. And uh, there's hotel accommodations, too, in Manhattan, and we have some group rates on that that will – Uh, need to be taken care of around the first part of August. So we'd be glad to have folks come. And even if they can't register by the 13th of August, they can still show up. Uh, We do take walk-ins on that as well. And registration fees are, when you consider the volume and the quality of the information, nominal, really? We think so. It's $200 for uh, two days. And if you bring extra people from your operation, it's $180 for them. Or if you just want to come for one day, it'd be $125. Uh, so that's a pretty reasonable fee for that. And again, all of these details can be found, including the path to registration on the Ag Manager website, right? That's correct. Agmanager.info and look for the Risk and Profit Conference on the events. Once again, congratulations, Rich, to you and your team for coming up with yet another fine lineup for Risk and Profit this year. It ought to be a lively one given some of the topics at hand, including the Farm Bill, including the trade issues that abound. And we wish you well with organizing the final details. Thanks for giving us a preview right here. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about it a little bit. You bet. Rich Llewellyn, Extension Assistant in Agricultural Economics at K-State, the 2018 Risk and Profit Conference at the university is now all set. For Thursday, August the 16th through the morning of Friday, August the 17th, once more this will be held at the Alumni Center on the K-State campus. Get your registrations in as soon as possible with that deadline of the 13th of August, and agmanager.info has all of the particulars that you would need concerning this program. You are tuned to Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. This is the K-State Radio Network, and you're listening to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and now for you today's agricultural news headlines in brief. House Agriculture Committee Chairman Michael Conaway of Texas said at a forum yesterday that the House vote on going to conference with the Senate on the Farm Bill will be held either today or Monday. 
Conaway had said earlier he expected the vote would be tomorrow, but said that date had to be changed because House Agriculture Ranking Member Colin Peterson could not be present tomorrow. He noted the vote is necessary because the Senate stripped the House language out of the bill and inserted its own bill. Through the motion, the House will object to that and will ask for a conference. Conaway vigorously defended the House bill's nutrition title that would impose work requirements on beneficiaries of SNAP and and tighten up eligibility requirements. The Senate bill, of course, does not contain those provisions. The Senate version passed 86 to 11, while the House bill passed 213 to 211 with only Republican votes. Conaway joked that he got twice as many votes as he needed since the bill passed by two votes rather than one. Conway also added he does not understand why he's getting so much pushback against the SNAP provision that would require beneficiaries to work 20 hours per week. If he brings up the 20-hour work requirement with farmers and ranchers, he says that they say they work three times that much. There are 10 million able-bodied adults between the ages of 18 and 59 who get SNAP benefits but do not report income, according to Conway. Now, critics, including Peterson, have said that the work requirements are impractical, particularly because many low-income people work at jobs with varying hours. Conaway said he has to get the message to senators and House Democrats that they will not want to be the candidates who go home and say they stopped the farm bill because work requirements for SNAP beneficiaries in the bill were too tough. And he said he believes the farm bill will be passed by September the 30th, when the current bill expires, because he's an optimist, but he declined to give odds on finishing by that date. Speaking with reporters, Conaway defended the president's actions on trade, saying that farmers want trade agreements enforced. The retaliatory tariffs that China plans to impose on U.S. farm products are illegal, in Conaway's words. He added that folks back home have to live with China's action. And Conaway said he has not been given any timeline about assistance to farmers to counter the effects of the trade disputes, but is going to a meeting at the White House this week and believes that that meeting will be about ways to protect farmers from the impact of the retaliatory tariffs. Meantime, support is likely to increase in Congress for lawmakers to take action relative to the recent trade actions by the Trump administration. According to House Ways and Means Chairman Kevin Brady, he said that as these tariffs continue to ramp up and escalate, he thinks there will be growing momentum for a legislative response or solution unless the administration, as he put it, frankly tackles three things well. Those three goals, he noted, included avoiding a legislative response, but the Trump administration administration needs to take the first step of laying out a clear timetable for resolving trade issues with China. Second, the Commerce Department, he says, needs to fix the broken exclusion process put in place to allow companies to appeal for relief from tariffs on steel and aluminum. Finally, Brady said there needs to be a better process for exempting countries from tariffs on steel and aluminum and possibly other goods. The Senate recently passed a largely symbolic motion that instructed lawmakers to recognize Congress' role on trade policy. And Mexico's incoming and outgoing governments will present a united front in the NAFTA renegotiation. According to Mexican Foreign Minister Luis Vidigare, a restart of talks between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico is expected to take place now that Mexico's elections brought a win for Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Vidigare noted the United Mexico front after a meeting with high-level U.S. officials, including Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. He said that former President Enrique Peña Nieto's administration and López Arbador's team will work as one front, as a joint front for Mexico. He said that's how they are working on the relationship with the United States. The new administration will officially take office on December the 1st. Well, closer to home, Kansas livestock producers faced with drought now have another option to consider before selling cattle off. Todd Domer reminds us here about the USDA disaster program now available to help with forage needs. The Kansas Farm Service Agency recently announced 44 Kansas counties are authorized for emergency haying and grazing of conservation reserve program acres. These counties, mostly in the eastern half of Kansas, are listed as D2 or severe drought on the U.S. drought monitor map. 
emergency haying in these counties will end August 15th with emergency grazing authorized through September 30th. This emergency use does not include CP25, which is designated for rare and declining habitat. There will be no CRP rental payment reduction for emergency haying or grazing. Producers in eligible counties can use CRP for their own livestock or grant another livestock producer use of their CRP. Eligible CRP is limited only to those acres within the approved county. The same CRP acres cannot be both hayed and or grazed at the same time. For example, if half of the field is hayed, the other half cannot be grazed. It must remain unhayed or ungrazed for wildlife. Only one cutting of hay is permitted and none of the hay can be sold. To see a map of Kansas counties authorized for this emergency use, go to fsa.usda.gov ks. For more information or to request approval, producers should contact their local farm service agency office. I'm Todd Domer. And Southwest Kansas-based Cattle Empire, LLC, has announced the sale of two of its feed yard locations with a combined one-time capacity of 139,000 head in Haskell County. This to Amarillo, Texas-based Friona Industries. The uh, addition of the two Cattle Empire yards boosts Friona's to the nation's second-largest cattle feeding entity with a one-time capacity now 577,000 head in eight yards in Texas and Kansas. Two years ago, Friona purchased two Texas feed yards from Cargill with a total one-time capacity of about 140,000 head. Cattle Empire sold its Yard 1 and Yard 2 locations, retaining its Yard 3 and Yard 3 North locations, again with a one-time capacity of 51,000 head. The company will now focus on expanding its customer cattle feeding segment, according to a statement from Cattle Empire, and it remains based in Satanta. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. A few weeks ago, I mentioned Marshall County, Marysville, and the Cooster House. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. It was the Cooster House I visited to see and meet with people concerned about the Cooster Garden. As the garden was once known, it still is known by that today, although no longer as elaborate as it once was under Charles Cooster and his wife Sylvia. The house once the home is now the Cooster Museum, showing us what it was like to live, for some, at that time. We know that Charles left Germany as a young child, maybe nine years old. The family sailed in November 1851 from Bremen. They arrived in New York City in January 1952. They moved to Cincinnati by train and from there moved over the years further west to stop and stay in Marysville, a frontier town at that time. It was 1860 when they arrived. Charles must have been a teenager then, speaking fluently German. Of course, he would by now have learned English. But as I never lost the Dutch language, he never lost the German language. The ability to speak and write two languages would have been very beneficial, especially for a frontier town where he initially worked in the store, supplying travelers going west with the needed merchandise. Charles intrigues me because of the history and memories he brought with him of the old country, in particular his love for gardens and the desire 
to create a garden around the house they built and what is now the museum. The man had tremendous energy and worked very hard, not only with his intellect, but also with his hands and spade. The small two-room house he had lived in in 1873 was expanded after his marriage. At that time, the American West was still the West. There still were Indian conflicts. People were moving along trails and later by train, but going west. And here was Charles slowly and energetically developing what we can view on old photographs, a beautiful and elaborate garden to be enjoyed by not only his family, but also by the locals. There were benches, statues, flowers and trees, the trees providing the much-needed shade. All the early photos only show a house on the prairie. As Charles himself said, there was only prairie. But Charles had his dream. He remembered the German gardens long left behind. He saw those gardens in his mind, and with the input from visiting eastern gardens, he developed his Mirisville garden even further. He realized and sensed the value of a garden. In summer on warm evenings, with the moon out, he would wake up the children and walk the garden paths and sit, enjoying the cooling breeze and the scent of shrubs and flowers like the mock oranges and the lilacs. He must have been a fascinating man with his passion for creating his garden. I would have loved to read his mind. Did he see in his mind what he left behind when he stepped onto the boat to come to what was then the new world? Was it somehow ingrained into him? He was in contact with plant breeders and horticulturists, and later he had a capable German horticulturalist help him with his garden and the development and maintenance. But why was this man so passionate? He wanted to create for his own family, his wife, and his children, what he had known as a young child. I'm sure he longed for and needed the garden for himself. But as the literature says, he was very happy to share his garden, and people took him up on that. They visited the garden as a place to visit, to linger longer, when they visited or had business in town. It was a special place, and they were welcomed. I can fully understand why some people have the interest and drive to restore the garden to honor the early pioneer family, the Coosters, but also for what it stood for. However, ever since I visited the Cooster Museum and walked the garden on a rainy Monday, I have been thinking. To do it right, and it only should be done right, is a big challenge. The challenge is not only to rebuild, recreate the garden as it was, or in the creative spirit of Charles Cooster, but it has to go way beyond. Charles worked 30 years to create the garden, and when you look at the old photographs, you see the change over time, the ultimate elaborate garden to be enjoyed, to walk through, to smell, and to watch the butterflies and insects. But not only that, also to eat the fruits as he planted fruit trees and harvested fruit. It's interesting that his son, who took over the block after his mother and later father's death, did not care for the garden. He built his own house, and the once beautiful garden fell into neglect. I do not know the town Mirishville. However, where Kansas towns look at themselves and are asking, who are we? Marysville has much to show, having been an active part of the Pony Express and many trails going west. Colonel Frank Marshall established a tavern and a ferry at the crossing of the Blue River. He named the post office, the town which grew up around the ferry and the tavern, Marysville after his wife. With all that and so much more, the good farmland, I see the restoration of the garden not as too big a problem. 
what I do see is an issue is that the upkeep and maintenance of such an historic place and treasure to the community should be well endowed and secured for further generations of visitors. Surely, Mayersville can rebuild the Cooster Garden and safeguard its future. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. That's our time for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.